I really like flying RC vehicles like drones and RC planes. In this video, I will try and build something to replace my transmitter receiver combo that I've been using for quite some time. To fly RC vehicles, you obviously need some sort of remote. I certainly don't want to complain about the remote that I've been using, but it has two small problems. For one, I only have one receiver for my transmitter. This means that I have to transplant the receiver each time I want to fly a new plane. This isn't a deal breaker, just a bit annoying, and I could easily fix it by just buying another receiver. The second annoyance is a lack of two-way communication. If I am flying an RC plane, it would be really useful if it could warn me if I am running out of battery. Being the type that likes to do as much myself as possible, building a DIY transmitter was a no-brainer. I really like doing as much myself as possible, because I will always know how everything is working. This is one of the things that annoys me about my receiver. I just don't know what most of these menus do. I could read the manual, but I make it a point not to. There certainly are already perfectly good designs out there, but they aren't enough for me. I not only want to build a simple Arduino transmitter, but instead something far more ambitious. I want to build something more along the lines of an audio pilot or Pixhawk. I will most definitely not build something that comes even close, but something with fly-by-wire and auto-return-to-home functionality should be possible. At least I hope so. Because of this, I decided to focus my attention on the receiver and not the transmitter. To fulfill my desired design goal, I have a few requirements in mind. For one, I would like to have lots of inputs and outputs. For example, I would like to measure voltages, currents, while also being able to control a lot of servos. As mentioned, it should also have some sort of intelligent flight system. This necessitates the inclusion of some sensors, like an accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer for orientation, and a pressure sensor for altitude. For this I use the MP6050 accelerometer gyroscope combo, the HM35883 magnetometer and the BMP180 pressure sensor. I will also definitely use this system to build a DIY drone in the future. My next choice was quite suboptimal. I included 4 stepper motor channels. This was done because I plan to use this system to build a robot in the future. If I ever do a version 2, I will probably just get rid of them. They just need too many pins and take up too much space. To act as a central processor for the receiver, I had some options, but in the end I decided to go with the Teensy 4.1. It is quite expensive, especially with the prices at the time of filming, but it also has a lot of I.O. pins and the fast processor means I hopefully won't have to worry about the processing power. Having a fast processor is really important, especially in real-time control systems like for example a drone. Another benefit is the onboard SD card slot. I can use this to log data from a flight for later analysis. Of course, I also have to build a transmitter. For this I decided to go with the Teensy LC. It is more than fast enough and has enough inputs for 6 analog channels, a few buttons, an MPU6050 and an I2C display. For communication I went with the NIF24L1 radio module. Now for the most important and difficult question, how to name it. Now I suck at naming things, but after a lot of thinking I ended up with the name Dave, short for Digital All Vehicle Electronics. If you have a better idea, leave a comment down below. I will gladly steal your ideas. After a few tests on a breadboard, I went straight to designing an appropriate schematic in Easy EDA. I included 12 servo channels, 4 analog read channels, 4 stepper motors, along with the sensors and communication modules. I also included a connection for a Bluetooth module. I didn't end up implementing it since I pretty much never use Bluetooth, but hey, it's there. I also exposed another serial and I2C bus as well as adding a status LED to one of the AI opens. After I was finished, I converted it to a PCB design and ordered them. And I have to say, I'm very happy with the quality. I think the matte black color looks amazing. I did something very similar with the PCB for the remote, but it's a lot simpler and quite a bit smaller. After some inspections, I began soldering all the components.
After I was done with soldering, I had to build some sort of remote I can actually use. Because just attaching port intrometers to the inputs of the transmitter would work, but it wouldn't be very practical. Now I could have designed one from scratch, but instead I chose the much simpler and faster solution by using an old broken remote and replacing the electronics with my PCB. I used this specific one because it allows easy access to the internals. After printing an adapter and crimping some wires, I had something that felt really good in the hands. I didn't include a battery since this is a first prototype. It can either be powered through USB or 12 volts. Note that for now I only connected the 6 analog channels to the two sticks and the two sliders. All the other inputs are currently not connected to anything. With the hardware for both the receiver and transmitter finished, I can start programming. Let's start with something simple. Great. One thing I noticed was the abnormally high CPU utilization. It turns out receiving all of the data from the TNZ is actually overwhelming my CPU, something I would not have expected. Let's move on to wireless communication, one of the most important parts. So what I've built up now is the transmitter and the receiver. The transmitter is basically reading each one of its six analog inputs, which are these six, and then transmitting the data over to the TNZ 4.1. Both of them are currently powered with 12 volts over their VCC lines. And the TNZ 4.1 is then sending the data to my computer through the USB connection. Yeah, we can see that it's working if I change the input of this channel. We can also see channel 0 on the TNZ 4.1 is also updating, which is nice. And this also works with channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, 4 and 5. I also included what I call the receive time. This is the time the receiver takes to receive data. Right now it is very low with only about 1 millisecond. This will increase if the connection becomes unstable. It will try to receive data for 250 milliseconds and after that it will just output no data connection and move on with the rest of the code. Note that while it tries to receive data, it will not do anything else. So if it is unable to receive anything, you can think of it like a big delay. Sadly the resolution of the data being sent is a bit low with an 8-bit value. But I don't know how to fix it and right now it's not really that big of a problem. I'm also not taking advantage of the entire range of values. You can see how the lowest and highest value received are nowhere close to 0 and 255. This is something I really need to fix. Next step, I wanted to set up all the output channels, so the stepper and server channels. This is going to take some time, so let's get to it. Miraculously, this was working on the first try, which is weird, since nothing ever works on the first try. Because of this, I didn't record it, so here's a dramatic reenactment. Let's try this. 
Wait, what? Why is it working? I was honestly surprised how much progress I was making. If this keeps going, I could be done with the implementation in a few days. I then tried to increase the max speed of the stepper motor by changing the stepper driver. At one point I replaced the driver and everything just stopped moving. I could see the current on the input rising uncomfortably high. Let me tell you this. Don't do this. Don't start replacing modules while your project is turned on. Because of this I ended up with a broken GNC. My best guess is that while plugging in the driver it created a voltage spike in either the supply voltage or the 5 volt line, which destroyed the voltage regulator and thereby the TNZ. I tried to fix it, hoping it was just the voltage regulator on the TNZ, but I couldn't. And of course I couldn't get my hands on a new TNZ since they were pretty much out of stock everywhere. Just great. Finally, about two weeks later I was able to get a new TNZ. At last I could start to make progress again. I plugged the TNZ in, uploaded the code and everything was working great. Then it broke again, without me doing pretty much anything. So anyway, I turned everything off and cried myself to sleep. The next day I sat down and started investigating. To me there could only be two causes for the broken TNZs. Either my PCB supplied more than 3.3V to one of the inputs or the 3.3V or 5V supply line was broken. Since I want to minimize my financial risk, I decided to use an Arduino Mega to plug into some of the pins on the PCB and simulate what a TNZ would do. To take useful measurements, I couldn't just use a multimeter like this one. I have to use an oscilloscope. For example, this is 6.6V AC, but on my oscilloscope I can actually see the waveform. This is very important to detect small voltage spikes. I started by adding a servo and having it constantly move between 0 and 180 degrees. And aha, what do we have here? Each time the servo changes direction, there is a voltage drop on the 5V supply line. This is because I was using the onboard 5V regulator to power my servo. Now this voltage drop alone would not really destroy the TNZ. But sometimes I could see a voltage spike right before the drop. I have seen spikes up to 7 volts and remember. This is the same voltage applied to the 5V input on the TNZ. So by removing a jumper and using an external 5V supply line, separate from the onboard one, the TNZ shouldn't break. After getting myself another TNZ, I plugged in a stepper and servo motor and kept it running for some time, while also keeping an eye on the voltage levels. Since nothing broke after about 3 hours, I concluded that it was fixed. Although it is working now, the input voltage is not as clean as I would like it to be. I thought about adding an extra large capacitor as the input and that did certainly help. Since the positive lead on such capacitors is longer than the negative lead, I often just bend it in an arc. Now you can see how close the positive lead comes to this, the enable pin. If I am not careful, I could connect 12 volts to the TNZ and destroy it. But I would never do something so stupid. I promise you I am not doing this on purpose. Luckily I have yet another TNZ on hand. I continued by adding the voltage read inputs. You have to be very careful about what voltage to apply. The two resistors built up a voltage divider and we can calculate the maximum input voltage by using this formula. Next I wanted to implement the sensors. When designing this board I connected the VCC line to 5 volts. It would have probably been fine since each module has a voltage regulator that turns the 5 volt into 3.3 volts, but with my history of killing teensies I was not going to take any chances. So I disconnected it from 5V using a screwdriver to scrape away the traces and used some wire to connect it to 3.3V. For the implementation I just chose a fitting library and pretty much just copy pasted the example code. Unfortunately the library I used for the MPU6050 also needs this pin connected to an interrupt pin, which it is not. But since every input on the TNZ supports interrupts, I just connected it to the first servo pin. 
This does knock down the number of servo channels from 12 to 11, but that is still more than enough. What I have right now is basically the backbone for a future project. I can easily read all the inputs and sensors and I only need to define what values the output should take. There are still some things I did not implement, notably the MPU6050 and LCD on the remote, as well as the Bluetooth module. I don't really have a reason to implement them yet, so they are currently not used. But I might add that in the future. Since this was built with planes and drones in mind, I wanted to test how it would hold up. I wanted to see if I could actually use it as a receiver. It would be really unfortunate if I would just lose connection in the middle of a flight. To test this, I decided to strap it onto a plane and let it fly as a passenger. At first I thought about designing a proper mount, but in the end I just used zip ties. In its role it is not actively controlling the plane. It is instead logging data like receive time under various circumstances to see if the connection is stable. To give myself the best chances I added bigger external antennas to increase the range and improve signal quality. If we take a look at the log data and ignore the values before takeoff and after landing, we can see two main regions. One where the receive time is very low and thereby the connection is stable and one where there is no connection at all. You might go with this and say, well, most of the time the connection is stable. But that is actually not the case. The x-axis does not represent time but rather the log entry. If we for example have 5 entries with a loop time of 10 milliseconds and 5 with a loop time of 250 milliseconds, this means that the first 5 entries represent a time of 50 milliseconds and the other 5 a time of 1.25 seconds. This means that the time the connection is stable is actually just the time it took me to take off. This is honestly kind of disappointing. I tried multiple different modules with or without antennas, but every time the connection is quickly lost. I have seen others that achieve a substantial range with these modules, so I suspect there is something wrong with my board layout. If you have any idea what could be the cause, leave a comment down below. For me this means that I have to use something different in the future. Finally I want to talk a little bit about costs. I don't want to focus on this too much since this is a first prototype, but in total I paid around a thousand <laughs> paid around one hundred dollars. That is around twenty five dollars plus a broken remote for the transmitter and $45 to $70 for the receiver, depending on what modules are installed. This does not include the three broken TNCs, which would double the price. This is definitely not cheap, but if I consider the possibilities, I would say it is worth it. At least if I am able to fix the transmission issues. There is just so much I could do with this, and if I do a version 2, I might be able to cut some cost and make it smaller. The TNC 4.1 is really overkill, and totally unnecessary if you just want a receiver. If you have any interest in the files, you can find everything on GitHub. I did fix the voltage problems, but I didn't test it. You can also find this version, but you probably shouldn't build either one of them. This is a first concept with a lot of issues and I will do a version 2 in the future. As one final thing, I designed and printed a stand for the PCB to let it stand on top of the fallen corpses of its predecessors. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to receive any videos I make in the future. I have final exams coming up, so you might not hear from me for a while, but that shouldn't be something new. See you soon.